Hi guys, welcome back to my channel. Um, my last video about the um, pizza collar bomber uh, has done quite well. I think that's because when I, I released it and then three weeks later they released this, um, the Netflix released this massive documentary about it and I honestly didn't have any idea they were going, they were going to. Honestly, when I, when I was making it there wasn't really much on the internet about it and that's why I did it. And if you if you look at my the day I posted it and uh, the day that the trailer for the thing uh, the it's called um, Evil Genius on Netflix uh, the day for when that came out mine came out about three weeks before I think so but so that's picked up a few views um, I think just from people searching for it after watching a Netflix documentary so I hope I hope it was an interesting case and was a bit different until Netflix released the document but I don't even have a Netflix account and I don't really like I don't like Netflix so I don't think it has a very good range of like films to watch. It's very I think I think it's got like five films that you want to watch and then after that it's like but yeah that's just my opinion of Netflix. But today I'm uh I didn't know whether to do um like some more bodybuilding I heard in a vlog or bodybuilding sort of a video because I've got some ideas for that but I thought I'd just do um, another sort of interesting case um, and this time it'll be about uh, the Death Valley Germans um, which I haven't seen I think that I've seen them mentioned in a few sort of like uh, videos where they'll put, post a few sort of like because this is Death Valley Germans went were a group of Germans uh, who went missing in Death Valley and I think they sort of get included in a lot of um, videos about being missing in sort of America's national parks. I think that's sort of, so they don't they don't get too much. Uh, they'll get like five minutes sort of mentioned, but actually I think they could have could do with their own video on YouTube. And I think I'm going to try and do my best to make a video about them. Uh, in fact, most of my information comes from uh, a guy called Tom. A guy called Tom Mahoud, Mahoud, I don't know, uh, uh, Mahoud, I think, um, and he, uh, he's like a, he's like a very experienced sort of like trekker and like very experienced going into Death Valley and trekking and um, hiking because Death Valley is such a, like it's so hard to like explore, it's so vast and so hot and so dry. So he's 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 uh, been. He's very good at that and I think he's done some other sort of like rescue missions where he's gone out and uh, into national parks and rest well tried to rescue people who've gone missing so he actually has a blog called otherhand.org and he has the story of the Death Valley Germans because he's very key in their story and he has some other blogs um, if you're interested in reading about people um, going around the parks, you know, what it takes, like trek, if you want to maybe uh, trek one day, um, I would recommend his blog because it sounds really hard and it sounds really dangerous and it's, 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 it does sound crazy, you'd be able to see things not many people have seen because you're in remote places of the world, but um, he, he'd give you a good idea of what you need to do and how the struggles you could face. Um, along the way so yeah he's he's got this blog and what happened was he did eventually find some remains which may have belonged to these Germans so uh, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about Death Valley so Death Valley is a national park um, in Nevada so its nearest uh, city would be Las Vegas I think it's about a four hour drive from Las Vegas you can get to Death Valley um, it's one of it's one of the hottest places in the world. It's definitely the hottest place in America. It had the highest recorded air temperature on Earth ever, which was fifty six point seven degrees Celsius, which is one hundred thirty four degrees Fahrenheit, and that was recorded on the tenth of July, nineteen thirteen. Uh, so no other no no other recording has beaten that since then. It's been that's the hottest the Earth has ever been in the air. Uh, so I actually went to Death Valley last year on holiday um, and that's what sort of piqued my interest in this case. We've been, um, we went all the way around uh, California, we went to the um, Grand Canyon and then we ended up in Death Valley and by the time we got to Death Valley it was 
about late June, early July, and we experienced temperatures of about 45 to 50 degrees while we were driving around. Like, uh, we were watching the temperature in our car and it was just got getting higher and higher as we went around. It was very hot. When when you're in the car in the aircon, it was still hot, but you'd, you'd stop to have a look at uh, the various things to see in Death Valley, like uh, Devil's Golf Course and Bad Water Basin, and you just get out and the heat would just hit you and you, you just immediately, it felt like you are like a really hot bath and you immediately feel your um, skin just re reacting to it, you could feel the, um, the sweat glands just going straight into overdrive, it was really really like, considering I live in the UK where the average temperature is like 10 degrees, um, it was really hot and I loved I love hot weather and it was really good but I think the maximum we were out was ten minutes and then you just like like or try to run back to the car and get like into the aircon is so hot um, and that's that the Death Valley Germans went missing during July so they went missing during this peak season where Death Valley reaches temperatures of like fifty two degrees like every day. That bearing in mind that people who go missing in national parks across the USA every year, you know, you've got you've got Yosemite, um, Yellowstone, and Death Valley, and among others. And I, I read a statistic that said the one to two people die in Death Valley every year just because of the exposure to the elements. So I don't know how true that is, but I could believe it. Like. If your car just if your car broke down in like a bad place, then you'd be. I mean, I, I think they've got. I didn't check my phone when I was there, but I think they've got like signal and stuff. So, but yeah, it's a very very dangerous place. So the case of the Death Valley Germans begins in October the twenty first, nineteen ninety six, and th this was where um. A guy, a park ranger, was in a helicopter and he was, he was uh, going, he was like flying above Death Valley, um, apparently looking for um, uh, drug manufacturing in the, like, in, like, see, like illegal drug manufacturing that could happen in the, the wilderness and the vastness of Death Valley. And by the way, all this information is from Tom, Tom's blog otherhand.org so I'm just sort of I'm just sort of summarizing this information he provides a much more detailed explanation if you want to go and read it after this video I've got it all linked down below it's a really good read I would recommend it highly I've just decided to do like a bit more of like a video coverage of this so I put in some pictures and uh, talk through some of my thoughts and stuff yeah so um, this ranger he was flying above Anvil Canyon what he spots is he spots a car there just parked up in Anvil Canyon on a road and this was really odd because this road was actually closed many years ago and it was actually illegal to drive down this road and secondly um, the road itself is so is so um, bad and it's just like it's just a back road in Death Valley you really need a 4x4 truck to to navigate across it and really like a, a competent driver because it's such a it's very hard to drive uh, when when I was in Death Valley and we drove because there are paved roads in Death Valley but we'd go off onto like a little bit of a gravelly road it was just like you're just shaking all the time it was really it was really harsh and like you know some people have to sit on that for like hours and hours to get to some places in Death Valley so it's um really hard so uh so this car wasn't a 4x4 that he'd found in Anvil Canyon, it was actually just a, a Plymouth Voyager. So like a passenger van. Real shock because this car shouldn't really have been there and it shouldn't have really even made it out that far there. So this ranger parks up his uh, helicopter and goes and inspects it. And he finds that uh, it's got three flat wheels and it's up to its axles in sand. Um, and he takes down the license plate uh, to run it through the system. He also, he, he can see that it's been there a while, it's quite dusty. When they run the license plate number through the system, they find that the car actually belongs to a LA car rental company who reported the car as stolen. Um, the last uh, reported drivers of the car were, um, I'll just read them out because they're in German. Um, 
the last people who rented the car were a German family. Uh, there was Egbert Rimkus, who was 34 years old, his son George Weber, who was 11, Egbert's girlfriend Cornelia Meir, who was 28, and her son Max Meir, who was four. So obviously this was a couple who had uh, met and they brought their children from previous relationships along um, as a sort of like um, they also found that this family had never actually boarded their plane home from LA. Uh, their, their flight was due to take off on the 27th, the, the 27th of July 1996 and they'd never boarded that plane. Uh, the car rental company had a policy they had to wait a month until they could uh, report the car as stolen. So this car wasn't reported as stolen um, until it would be end of August that year so um, I don't know if any authorities in, investigated this because you know if, if a family a family doesn't wouldn't usually steal a rental car and make off with it they'd probably come into some bad bad luck so but I don't know about this so immediately uh, after the range had found this uh, vehicle a, a big search took place and I'm going to read out a list of a few of the items found within uh, this vehicle. Um, so they found an American flag from geologist's cabin, which is about four miles away from the car. So this shows that they had visited this cabin because they had a flag that said uh, geologist's cabin on the flag. Um, and this cabin was a, a good shelter, it had food and water. Uh, they had two unopened bottles of bud ice and one empty bottle. Uh, they had one empty and one three-quarter full bottle of bourbon. Uh, several large uh, empty water and juice containers, uh, luggage and clothing, numerous exposed rolls of 35mm film and a Practica 35mm camera, one new Coleman sleeping bag in its box and one empty Coleman sleeping bag box, a tent, a pipe with tobacco, a leather card carrier containing Swiss bank cards and a City Corp card for Egbert. A card from the Seahorse Resort in San Clement. Numerous toys and an unused compact spare tyre and jack. Obviously every car comes with a spare tyre but if you've got three shredded tyres then that's not going to be much use to you. Um, and they also shifted this van and put it in a compound. Um, I don't know how they shifted the van, it must have been quite an effort. That, it was also discovered in the Warm Springs mine site, uh, which is like a little visitor centre, that the Germans had signed the logbook on the 23rd of July. They'd signed all their names, Connie, Egbert, etc. And in German it said, we are going over the pass. This pass was probably referring to Mengel's pass. Um, however, this pass is only accessible by a 4x4 four four, uh, truck uh, off-roader, so they mustn't have they mustn't have thought that or known that they couldn't have uh, traversed it in their car. So a massive search ensued um, for four days, and it cost about $90,000 in 1996 terms of money, so that'd be a lot more than today's uh, due to inflation and stuff. And the first day was rather promising. They found they found an empty bottle of beer um, and sort of a seed print, so it looks like someone had been sitting down under a bush a few miles away from the car. And it looks like it looks about the size of Egbert, and it looks like he was um, he'd sat down to have a break, uh, to drink a bit, and to, that he was seeking shelter from the afternoon sun. Because uh, where the bush was situated, it would provide shade when the sun was uh, in like an afternoon sort of position. Um, and this is, must have been where he planned to go, what to do next or where to go next. It provided a bit of a view um, of like where, which, which direction they could have walked in. And then over the course of the rest of the search, they didn't discover anything. They, there was nothing came up. They had loads of people searching they had they had helicopters and teams and it cost a lot of money and they didn't find anything uh, over the years after this um various i suppose the family uh, of this missing family uh, in germany would have hired maybe some private 
uh, teams or something to have a look to have a look and try find it, uh, any evidence of them in the um, in the valley. Uh, and this made quite a few um, theories that they'd like ran off or they, and made a new life um, because I think Egbert was having trouble with his over custody issues over his son with his ex wife. Um, but at the same time, Corn, uh, Corn Cornelia had quite a good business in uh, Germany, so it didn't seem to make sense that she'd run off. Um, there was like alien abductions uh, because it's in like an area like Area Fifty One, um, and also that they might have been murdered out there because uh, nobody because. Oh, I mean, most likely they did just die in the desert. But if you've got no bones or no remains, you don't, you can't say for sure, can you? Like, the, there's lots of scenarios that can go through your mind. Now, uh, Tom, who is the, who I've mentioned before, he's the writer of Otherhand.org, and he's the, uh, he uh, eventually f uh, found them. Um, he got interested in the case in two thousand eight, so twelve years after the uh, Germans went missing. He says that he was on um, a website forum uh, about Death Valley and they popped up and he was reading about them and he had uh, contacts that were in the original search so he found a woman who was in the original search and asked her loads of questions. He even went into uh, university professors who had written like reports about it and he just got all the information he could and um, he just was really interested and really wanted to see if he could help and find them. So he decided to do his own solo search in October. Now in Death Valley, um, they do, I mean, you can hike in Death Valley and trek and stuff, you can do that, but they do recommend that you don't do it during the peak of summer. They say about October to April is, is when you can go, and then when summer hits, you know, it's, it'd be, you'd die, like, you know, it'd just be impossible. So he did his own solo search in October of 2008, and he just went to the, he found the site where the van was, because he had all the original, like, uh, coordinates, and um, he thought, he went and thought he found the beer bottle bush, it looked similar, as this in the sort of, they had coordinates for it, but they weren't exact, so he went and found this bush, and he just had a little think, he did, he did uh, look, there was some burrow tracks and burrow was like a type of donkey or mule and um, he followed these tracks thinking that if he was a lost person like the Germans were, they looked a bit like human footprints um, and the people might have followed them um, and then he followed uh, this a bit, this lead, but uh, he didn't think that they'd gone this route, it didn't really reveal anything and um, I don't think it, it, would, it, made, it would have made sense for anyone to have uh, followed, followed these tracks. So what Egbert did, which was really good, was he thought logically about what the Germans might have done. Um, he backtracked and saw and saw what they had, um, where they'd been in the days before they, uh, their car had uh, broken down. It was reported that Furnace Creek sold two books in German on the 22nd of July 1996 and they didn't sell any the next day so this put them at Furnace Creek on the 22nd of July however they hadn't stayed in uh, the Furnace Creek uh, hotel or a hotel near there's no records of them staying anywhere um, this might have been because uh, they were running low on money because Egbert had tried to ask his ex-wife for money to be wired and she never actually did wire the money um, and he'd also wired some other money through, so there was a indication that they were low on funds and probably couldn't afford a hotel. It was right at the end of the holiday, and maybe they just sort of like not budgeted, budgeted very well. And so he thought that they might have gone camping in uh, in Han Han Hanapa Canyon. I can't say. Um, I'll put the. I'll put the thing down below. Um, he thought they might have gone camping there because it was cooler. Because even though it was July, it gets really hot. Even at night, it's like thirty degrees at the night. But if you go if you go up, it gets a bit cooler. And he thought they might have camped there for the. Night. And this also gave another bit more insight. He thought that because they were tight on time, because their flight was due on the 27th of July, they had to return the car in LA by the 26th of the July. 
they also wanted to get through uh, Yosemite when um, before they dropped off their car. So they had quite a lot to squeeze in. So he thought that when he went through to this valley to camp, the back roads there are quite are reasonable and are accessible by a normal car, such as the car they were driving. So it maybe would have led him to believe that all back roads were the same. So when he was looking at a map and he saw like the main road and he saw all these like little back roads and the, they offered like um, shortcuts and stuff, he might have thought, well, this back road to this canyon was fine. Uh, my car will it'll be fine to just go through any back road in Death Valley where, in fact, um, the road they eventually went on was very, very bad. On July 23rd the next day, they started driving down and they made two visits to um, two uh, cabins along the way, the geologist's cabin and the warm springs sort of cabin. And when they both, when they went in both of them, they were both deserted, so there's no one there. And they may have gone in to ask about road conditions, like maybe they were going to ask, oh, is this road okay? So they might have uh, called into these cabins to discuss uh, the road conditions because the road was getting progressively worse as they had been driving down this direction. But at the same time, they might not have wanted to turn back because they've already put a lot of time into this journey um, and it, probably hours and hours and, you know, they, they were tight on time. Uh, and then one last bad decision was that as they were driving down, there was on the map showing um, to, uh, a road that within two hours would have got them back to the paved road. Uh, but this is in the opposite direction, so it would have added, you know, like hours onto their time. Uh, but the map that they had showed them this road, which was now closed through Anvil Canyon. It must have been an old map because it said it was still a road. So they decided to carry on and go down this road through Anvil Canyon and this was the road that they eventually uh, broke down on because it was so rocky that it would have just shredded the tyres. At this point, um, Tom thinks that Egbert would have had a wonder to see what to do with the situation. Um, he would have uh, sat on that bush and contemplated where to go. So from the north of their position was Furnace Creek, which was the big visitor centre and is probably the most equipped place and uh, biggest hub in Death Valley if you like but this was way too far away they'd already driven probably hours drive away so it would have been too far to walk in the July heat. There was a t little place called Ballarat um, but it, this ha they hadn't been to this point so they had didn't know what services it could provide to them and um, I think when he had this van broken down he instead of instead of thinking right I'm in a survival situation we need to do whatever we can to survive um, they were more concerned about getting this van towed, getting this van back on time to the LA um, car hire place and getting their flight home. They were, didn't re immediately realise that this was a very dangerous situation. There was also Badwater Basin and this was a bit closer than Furnace Creek but this didn't have any sort of uh, services there. Badwater Basin is just a place tourists go so um, unless there was some tourists coming back driving past that could have helped them. Uh, this didn't seem very promising. However, there was one one solution and that was China Lake, which was south of their position. And China Lake is a bit like Area 51. It's a it's a big uh, desert military installation. And when Egbert looked at the map, the north border of China Lake um, was an on, only an eight to nine mile uh, walk away. Um, and the terrain this way was probably all right. Um, and Egbert might have thought that uh, right at the border there would have been gates, armed guards, you know, uh, military personnel who could have helped them. Um, however, um, Tom says that uh, USA military installations don't really have, they don't have their uh, fences and uh, border patrol. They sort of rely on how vast they are and how out of, you know, out of the way they are and how remote they are as their security, they literally just rely on being in Death Valley, basically. But Egbert wasn't to know that, if coming from Germany, he might have thought it was a bit more like, um, there's a bit more uh, going on at the border, to so to speak. 
So Egbert would have probably gone back to the car and they would have probably camped out a bit because there was evidence of um, cat holes and uh, evidence that they'd stayed there for a, a decent amount of time to sort of, you know, have a drink and eat some food and p prepare for the journey the next day. So on the 24th of July, that is when they uh, set off. At one point along this journey, they would have known that there would have been a cabin only four miles away with food and shelter available to them and water. But they must, as I said, they must have thought that they weren't in a survival situation because they didn't go for this cabin and wait it out. They're probably just more concerned about finding someone and getting this car back to the um, get, and getting this car back to the higher place. So using all this logic that he had thought of, Tom thought, well, it's now time to search south. And apparently in the initial searches, uh, they hadn't really searched south that much. They didn't think they didn't think they'd go that way because north is where all the sort of uh, things are. So they thought they probably would have gone north, but they didn't search south. So they... I, I thought, I think in a search situation they should have searched south a bit more, I don't know why they didn't, but um, but Tom, Tom decided to do it on his own. Well, Tom found a friend that would go with them and they set off on and they made this journey in about late 2009 or 2010 I want to say, so a bit after 2008 and he went with this friend and it was quite a dangerous trek to do to trek south where they thought that the Germans had trekked because um, there's, there's only so much water you can carry with you so they had to um, sort of set up a base camp and also find water along the way but luckily uh, Tom and his friend were very experienced at this and they did actually manage to find some water and they knew if they hadn't found some water they would have had to have abort their mission because it wouldn't it would not have worked they would have run out of water and it would have been a very dangerous situation. And on this search, this is where they found uh, the most evidence of the Germans. Along the way, they found a wine bottle. Then they found some pages of writing with German writing on them. And then finally, uh, Tom's friend discovered bones along this trek with a wallet nearby. And the wallet contained ID cards belonging to Cornelia which led them to believe the bones were belonging to Cornelia. And to, to get to this point from the van, Cornelia would have had to have walked eight to nine miles in the hot, probably 45 degree uh, July sun in normal shoes. And it would have been a really tough, tough walk. It would have been hilly. It would have been... Um, really like rough it would have just been a real a real struggle to have gotten this far so they'd actually actually made it quite a bit further than they they would have anticipated so tom uh brought back uh cornelia's id card as proof that he'd found her and he went back to talk to the authorities and this uh, resulted in another search going on in about uh, early uh, 2010 and uh, on this search, Tom didn't actually have as much of an active role. I think he just sort of led them to where he found her and they, they had their own search teams. And I think all they found was a few other bones. I don't think they found anything else. And then quite a while later, they contacted Tom saying that they'd actually managed to extract some DNA from deep within these bones and were able to match them to Egbert. But... um. Some people say they're still listed as missing people. Um, uh, Tom was still interested in this case because there's still no sign of the missing children. And Tom actually did a few more searches uh, during 2010, but he he went um, he didn't find anything. He didn't find anything belonging to the children. No more bones, no more ID, nothing. Um, and that's sort of where that concluded for him. Um, so I don't really know how long bones would last because Egbert and Cornelia's bones sort of lasted 12 years in the desert. I don't know if the heat helps preserve the bones or if it helps to generate the bones because um, there's not a lot of like life out there to sort of eat away at, the, at them. Um, I think I think the children's, especially the bones of a four-year-old, would be so small um, could have, they could have been buried because as far as I can tell on this search uh, Tom and his friend were sort of searching on the surface 
um, which is all you can do really. Um, and something has to be sort of peeking out. There's no way. It's not, there's not like a metal detector for human remains really. So uh, the, I think the bones are probably buried or um, maybe disintegrated because um, they were so much uh, smaller and maybe he's weaker because sometimes children's bones can be not as strong as adult bones. And a good point Tom made through all of this is that he he believed that the Germans weren't stupid, but they did make a series of sort of very genuine mistakes from thinking that their car could handle these back roads um, to sort of going out on back roads in the middle of July heat um, to once they got on the bad roads, instead of turning back, kept going because they were already committed. I mean, what's sad about this case is that there was they had their two children with them who were only 11 and 4 and you'd kind of hope that the adults would have known a bit better, that they would have been a bit more cautious with knowing that they had two two children with them. Um, you know, it, it does seem like a very silly idea to drive on the back roads in a Voyager van. Um, I mean, I drove on, we drove on some back roads in a Ford Explorer, which isn't really a 4x4 truck or anything, but it's a big car, and that was rough. And we were on one road for like an hour, and it was just the worst, it was the worst, really. And they would have been driving on these roads for hours. Um, I truly feel for this family, because dying in the desert must have been an excruciating death, a really you know, horrible death. Um, they probably didn't know that they were in such a dangerous situation. That's why they did what they did and went down to China Lake instead of going back to the cabin and just sort of staying there until help arrived. Even if help arrived like weeks later, it would have been, they could have possibly survived with the food and the water that was provided in that cabin and the shelter from the hot sun. They wouldn't have been exposed to the elements like they were. Concluding this video, I hope you enjoyed it and I hope uh, you found it interesting and I hope at least it's a warning to be careful in Death Valley if you ever go to Death Valley. Uh, Death Valley is such an amazing place and I would always recommend anyone to go to Death Valley um, but just to be careful about it. Um, it's, I think it's better now that people have phones and I think there's quite good signal there so if you did get lost I mean you could ring someone. Uh, ring the emergency services, whereas back in 1996, it was just, you know, you were sort of on your own. Um, I found a good map that sort of visually shows what the Death Valley Germans went, and so you can see on a map, like, how, like, the directions and how far they were, because I, I understand not a lot of people know, like, what, what Anvil Canyon is, Warm Springs, the geologist's cabin, like, how, and how far away these places are, but um, hopefully this will become clearer in the next section. Right, hi guys, I just wanted to show you this um this like handy map or infographic which is really um really good at visualizing uh this actual journey because I know I, t I talked about it in the video but um it would have been a bit confusing. Um I hope this would make it a bit clearer. So I'll just run through this quickly with you because um it's quite hard to find a, a good high quality version of this so I don't I think it would be handy if I just went through it with you using a bit more information. So in, in the top left, just got a bit about um, the introduction and this is the guy who found them. Um, and that's his website, thehand.org. So uh, this is just a theory by Tom. Um, it's... It might not be... It might not be exactly what happened to them because it's only going off records um no one knows how, what they did in their final days because mm, they were alone um so this is just a theory but i think it's it's based on logic and i think it's very good so we'll just get started right um just an overview this is like a section of death valley so up above uh, not included in this map is um furnace creek and that's where you know the hottest temperature was recorded and it's uh it's a, a, it's like the biggest hub. It's got like you know a visitor centre and just toilets and stuff, and it's you know so they 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 were def well no they weren't definitely there, but they, that place sold uh, two books in German. So they th on the was it the twenty second of July? So they they think that they and I think they found those books in the car. So they they must have stopped at Furnace Creek on the twenty second of July. Um, so. 
as I said in the video, there's no records of them uh, anywhere staying in accommodation. So they must have camped out somewhere and they did have camping gear in their car. So Tom thinks they went in this canyon, this um, Hanapa Canyon, the one that I couldn't pronounce, um, which would have bit provided a bit of cool shade. Now also remember this is this is that that's the paved road this black road this is the I've we I've been on this road this road's fine I don't they, I don't know why they set off on this this unpaved road um but when they went up to this canyon Tom says this this road to this canyon is pretty it's okay for a back road certainly manageable for their car which would have possibly led them to believe that all the back roads on the map were of a similar standard so you know you see a map and you know you see all these like roads but it doesn't tell you much about the quality of the road so they wouldn't have known that it was going to take a turn for the worse so after they camped here they continued down this unpaved road um, which it says here is in better shape than most of the back roads in Death Valley. Um, and it's just going on about going through Mengel Pass. Is that Mengel Pass? Oh, it might have been. Um, and it said then it says here Egbert managed to drive it into areas where stronger vehicles have failed. So I don't know if that's a testament to the Plymouth Voyager. I mean. Um, but I think people err on the side of caution. Um, they wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't encourage anyone to go down here in a normal, normal sort of car. But maybe a normal car could manage it. But um, think about all the gravel, all the rocks, you know, um, just all the sharp edges of the road could, you know, it's just a matter of time before the tyres went. Um, and time scale, I think. I I don't know when you read the other hand you 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 think they've been driving for hours on this road but to get from Furnace Creek to um down here down to the Warm Springs is only two hours but as on the paved road so it might have taken them maybe a couple more hours on this unpaved road because you do have to go slower on the unpaved roads so or it's just too uncomfortable it's just too bumpy a ride. Um, so he continued all the way down to here. Um, now, I don't know if this is the bit where um, Tom says getting back to the main road would have taken two hours. But I don't think it is, because that wouldn't take two hours. Um, so I don't know why they wouldn't... Oh, it would have been this road up here. Is that a road? I can't see it. Like, it's just a road that ends there. I don't know. I don't know why they wouldn't have gone to the main path, because it it is. Well, I don't know. It's sort of in the right direction. I mean, I know this might be. They might have thought this was quicker. Um, so this is where they went through Warm Springs Camp. Oh, unless they wanted to actually visit these Warm Springs Camp, if they had an interest in seeing these like cabins and stuff. Um, they signed the logbook, and that's where they said we are going over the pass. Um. And they might have been finding out about road conditions. Um, I'll just show you a bit of... This is Death Valley. I've got... See, this is the route from Furnace Creek to Warm Springs. But this is on this is on the main road. That's the main road. So you can see it's, you can see it's paved. It's like black tarmac. Then they went on this road or something similar. And this is... I mean, you know, it's just... It doesn't... It looks very... Mm, doesn't looks like it does look like a road, but I mean you just can't tell what the state of it would be like. Um, so I'll just show you um, Warm Springs cabin because that's interesting to look at. Um. Yeah, I can see some pictures of it. I uh, remember they went in 1996, so it might have looked a bit different than this, but it's just a little cabin out in Death Valley. Looks interesting. Um, yeah, I, th I think... 
I think they would have just stopped here very briefly. I don't see this being a, a sort of attraction, really. Maybe it's the geologist's cabin. Uh, so they're getting further in the canyon now. And it's just going to get rougher and rougher. Um, this is just going to get worse and worse. Um, they might have been worrisome. But as the family entered Butt Valley, the road would have gotten better. So as they got this bit, would have been obviously quite rough. But then as they got into this bit, this would have opened out a bit and sort of probably had been a bit of a smoother ride. Um, now this must be where geologists' cabin is, because they found a flag from the cabin in their van. And now this 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 cabin is just four miles from the van. So the van was here. So that was four miles away from where they like sort of broke down. So, as I said, they obviously didn't think they were in a survival situation because they ended up wanting to trek all the way down here. Um, you know, they must... They didn't want to camp out there and wait and miss their flight, miss their hire car, get all the fees, you know, lose all the money, didn't have much money. Uh, they wanted to go find immediate help. Um, I'll just show you geologist's cabin. there um so yeah so they went i think they went down there a bit more um yeah i think needle peak sort of where they were like gone um so geologist cabin looks a bit more like like old american sort of how you'd think so, so it looks like they got water you know, shelter from the hot sun, canned food. So this would have been a good place to camp out until some help would have arrived. I mean, you would have been unsure when it would have arrived. I mean, I don't know how many visitors. This is very out the way. Um, but maybe the park, a park ranger would have seen their car. Yeah, so after this... They went. They, he thinks they went down. This is Mengel Pass, not that other pass I was talking about. This is Mengel Pass, um, and then this would have become clear that their van was just completely incapable of going any any further forward. Like it would have maybe it just might not have been a road. It might have just been like big boulders and stuff there. So this is the shortcut the map showed. Um, I don't know if this the the shortcut there's a road through there. I don't know. Um, a road back or a road leading back onto this, the Warm Springs Canyon, um. But this is the road that was closed. You know what the rain just saw the the van here, and he's like, oh, "Why is why is there even a car on that road?" Um. And the bucket, the van became stuck in the sand and had three flat tires. Um. I mean, yeah, because they wouldn't have wanted to go back through here. Because th I mean, that was a that would have already been a very rough, long ride. So the prospect of like going back through it, and then back onto the paved road must have he must have he took his chances with this. And like I said, it's a it's just like a a, a, a sort of honest mistake. Um, and then, uh, this is the way he sat in the bush. Um, looked and saw this military board, which is probably the closest thing near here. Because, um, as you can see, bad water bit. I mean, you couldn't track that, could you? I mean, but this looks almost manageable. And, um, yeah, so they spent the night there. And then this is, they would have walked down one of these three routes, Tom thinks. See, that they were all kind of manageable. They could have picked either one would have led the same direction. And then this is where the remains were found because um, they would have possibly, like, seen the actual border but seen, like, absolutely nothing, just seen, like, there was no gates, no people and just maybe it's just, like, been exhausted and just sort of, like, sat down and then this is where they both died. Um, it says here the remains of what was likely the children was found nearby. I don't know... I mean, in the blog, it didn't say that he found the children. Um, I think they must have just found remains which they couldn't identify. I think, oh, they found some little, like, little 
bones that could have belonged to animals. So, you know, they didn't really know. Um, yeah, so very sad story. Um, yeah, so go to his website if you want to f- read the full story because it is, it is interesting. It like especially when I was in I read this when I was in Death Valley. Like every night I would like read read. It takes a while to read, but I'd read the story because it's just because I was there and like you know it just really puts you into perspective. Um, you know Death Death Valley. I really love Death Valley, but it's probably one of the most harshest places on earth, really. As a shame, you know, like just look how vast it is. Like this is all Death Valley. Death Valley Junction. It's like the border. You know, it's just, you know, like such a big area. And then that was uh, there's there's Los Angeles, which is what. So they're trying to get down from there to Los Angeles. Yeah. So I hope I hope that was helpful, and I hope that brought a bit more insight into where where they that where they went in the distances I th- reading the blog makes you think that they spent hours and hours and hours on the road but if you actually drove on the paved road it would have been really quick but i don't know if it how much longer it would have taken on this road obviously i think tom will have driven on these roads so he'll know so they are, they must have obviously taken a lot of time yeah so it re- raises a lot of questions doesn't it so Yeah, well, thank you for watching for this video and I'll see you next time.